Okay, hit go live. Is it on? Yeah. All right, we're here. Hello. It's time for Monster Art School with me, Steve Ellis. Um, this time we're going to do a little bit more of a serious version, um, but I need one second to do one thing, and I'll be right back. Okay, it's recording and everything. Good. So we're good to go. I okay. No, no, the other, the other one. All right, cool. Sorry. Just wanted to make sure because I forgot to tell my assistant Luna to help me do the uh, You'll be recording. Me on camera. Okay, so today we're gonna draw a horse. I'm gonna turn my paper sideways, and I want to talk about a few things. Like, so if you saw the earlier one, we kind of went over basic shapes of what a horse is, and we're gonna go over the same again, but this time with a little bit more detail. So, and this is going to be the, the adult edition, or the grown-up edition. So, like here we go. Like teens and sure, teens and grown-ups. So, I'm going to pull this camera in a little closer so you guys can see okay. everything that I'm doing. And I need my eraser. Uh, no, 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 please leave that alone. I already got it where I want it. Dad, okay. Okay, so the things I'm using today. Do you have I don't know where it went. It, it, oh, it's right here. Okay. okay. So, I have my eraser. It's one tool. Okay. I've got a red colored pencil, although I have the erasable kind. So if you don't have the erasable kind, don't I wouldn't necessarily it. use it. Just use something you can erase, but I like using red because I can see it separately from the black. And then I have my Dixon Ticonderoga black HB pencil, which I like. This is good for like nice detail stuff. And I've got two of those ready to go. Um, I want to keep them sharpened so that I know where I'm going. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about drawing. Um, so I have this scrap of paper here. When I draw, when I'm doing my loose drawing, I draw a little bit like this. So I hold my pencil like so. So it gives me more of the ability to draw with my elbow and my shoulder rather than just drawing with my wrist like this. <clears throat> so my loose drawing is like this, and then eventually when I want to get detail in, then I'll go and I'll do something more like this. So what I'm going to try and do is show you how to get some movement and energy and action out of your drawing when we're drawing a horse or a unicorn or whatever this is going to be. I think think a, a horse unicorn, whatever. <laughs> so the first thing... The what? Yeah, that's what we did the last time. So the first thing I'm going to start with is I'm going to adjust my light. I'm going to start thinking about what the position of the horse <clears throat> is going to be. And um, so I've, I'm going to start with the head. Just like I'm drawing a gesture of a person or something else, I'm going to start with the head. I'm going to draw down its neck. And I'm going to keep this loose. <clears throat> I'm going to go over its back. Shut the door. Yeah, thank you, because I can hear someone singing out there. So, I go over its neck. Now right now, it kind of looks like a big bloopy lobby thing, but we'll fix that. So the first thing I'm gonna get is I'm gonna make sure there's a sphere here. And off the top of that sphere, I'm gonna come down at a curve till I meet the shoulder. In this case, since I want the horse to feel like he's running, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna bring the shoulder up and I'm gonna bring his head down. <clears throat> so, uh, so that and this is the this is the circle for the skull, and then I'm going to draw a cone, a flattened cone off that, like so. I actually think I'm going to bring it around a little bit more, so it looks like it's really running. And in order to do that, I need to consider the fact that the neck is going to come under and up, like so. Now the anatomical things I want to look for here are the fact that the skull has kind of a, the upper part of the cranium and the, the side of the skull is here. So the eye socket is going to be somewhere around here. And then you have essentially the analog to a human nose down here on the cone. And then you've got the mouth kind of down here. 
and I'll get more detail into this later on. But right now, I just want to get the basic, basic ideas and shapes in here. And so now I'm gonna. Yeah, please just don't leave that alone. Thank you. I know. If you want to clean it up, that's fine. But I'm basically gonna draw. I don't like that eye. I'm gonna get rid of it for now. I'm going to draw a circle for its upper arm going from its shoulder to around its inside of its, what would be its elbow down here. And then I'm going to draw it along the spine that goes over the shoulder and down and then back over the hips. And when we measure this, we have to figure out what the length of the horse is. So if this is this long, the rib cage is about going to be about the same length as that. So the rib cage comes out like so. And since he's running, I'm going to swoop he the rib cage up. Or she. He or she. And then I'm going to get into. Them. Let's just call her there. Or... And then I'm going to get into the back hip area here. And again, it's another oval. And I'm angling it. I'm going to angle this one kind of angled forward. And I'm angled this one backward to give the impression of movement. So the leg is going to come out like so. And the front leg will come like this. And we'll have a straight leg here for the leg that's behind on the other side, flip side of the body, because we always have to draw on both sides. And when it's leaping, the horse's both legs in the back kind of work almost in unison. But I'll I'll give a little bit of a hint of that back here. Hey and if we look for what people just joined right now, so perfect. I think you might wanna... Okay. Thank you. So okay. what I'm doing is I'm, I'm basically breaking down basic shapes. We started with a circle here. From that circle, we drew down over the back of the neck to the circle of the shoulder. And then we drew a rib cage kind of oval here. And then another big oval over here for the hips. And then I'm connecting them like so. And I'm going for a running horse. So this will be a little bit more challenging than just a standing horse. So this, this leg here, I'm going to go from the shoulder down to his elbow here. I'm going to bring this to its, essentially its wrist. And then we're going to come forward to its hoof up here. And basically, you can break it down into simple shapes. You've got a tube. You've got kind of a triangled off square. You've got other tubes. You've got, you can draw ball joints for each joint. And here, just to remember that everything you're drawing needs to feel three-dimensional. So you're always going to have marks that move across the surface. So you're going to draw around each object rather than, <coughs> rather than just drawing the edge, you're going to draw under it and behind it. So that's why I keep these lots of these loose lines in here, so that I'm always drawing drawing around and behind. So now I'm going to come up here. So this is just breaking in the basic shapes of the horse. But I'm going to basically take the circle that was the cranium of the head, and I'm going to, from the back of the neck, I'm going to draw a line that goes like so. And that's really these giant muscles in the neck of the horse that come down and connect. If this was a human, this would be the sternocleidomastoid, and this would be the clavicle. Uh, they probably have different names for it on the horse. And so it's probably its, it's throat's in there. And then we're going to have the head. Are we getting any questions, honey? No. Okay. Uh, I can see. Are people logging on? Or? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Hi, everyone. So now we've got this, going pretty quick. this part. Yeah, well, you know, it can work a little bit faster. 
So we're gonna get the other leg in. Now this leg is gonna kind of straighten up because as its body's moving forward, this leg has to per get purchase on the ground. So it's gonna kind of straighten up like so and hit the ground down here. So you go, again, you go from, you have to imagine the shoulder on the other side because we can't see it to the elbow here. And they're gonna be about the same height down to the horse's wrist and then kind of go in and back out over the hoof and then for back here I'm going to get this in and I'm going to go bring it bring us all the way back to we have a few comments oh yeah questions. okay well comments are good you don't have to read comments, Jim though. Jim Higgins said, hey, you're up and running. Awesome. Yep, up and running, Jim. I'm going to try and do it every day. And then Michael Rack. Sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Nope, that's how you say it. Mike's an old college buddy of mine. Hi, Mike. Okay. Uh, hey, he said, hey, St hey, Steve, glad you're doing this, buddy. It is awesome. Thank you. I'm having fun. <laughs> so we've got it's a way of spending some time with, with my daughter and my son. And right. the drawing. They don't, you won't see him often. No, probably not. Which is he's, sad. He's not as much of a drawing person as we are. So we've got our... Well, he stitches sometimes. You can yeah. see some of his stitches. He's actually so we've, really good. Yeah. We've got some. He is, you're right. We've got some of the basics. Whoops, I'm not going to ghost that in. I'm, let me address that. So if the back of the leg comes to here, it's essentially an elbow. Do you <clears> use <throat> the ink tray? Do you have time? Probably not. Why? Did someone ask me that? Or no, I'm just saying. Oh, okay, no, probably not. Because we'll see. I don't know. I don't think so. But I'm going to go in with my, my point now and kind of start to refine stuff. I want to make sure that I get this right. So this hoof, this hoof up here actually has to hit the ground like that. Because in a way, the horse is doing this. It's le One leg is coming forward. And its back leg is going to come to the tip. So it's a little hard to do because it's hard to figure out exactly how this works, but because horses are different than people. But we're going to get something along the lines of that. And then let's throw in the tail. The tail and the hair are a really good place to like bring in some movement. Tail and the mane, sorry, not the tail and the hair. And I can really accentuate the idea of the horse is running with the tail. So let's get into some more detail because right now we've got this nice loose horse. Uh, yep. Jimmy, uh, Jim Higgins has a comment and oh, yeah? a question. Okay, what's that? Uh, uh, Jim Higgins says, Steve. Yes. Is it a good idea for some people to draw legs on the other side through the body of the figure so there's a guideline to the upper joints? So I guess what you're getting at is, yeah, do you want to, do you want to be able to draw the other, the, the, the far leg through the body so you can see where it is? I mean, you can. In fact, I mean, from a side shot like this, what I'm doing is I'm kind of just mirroring what I have on this side. But... You do make a good point because the shoulder on the side closest to us here is pushed up so that the leg can move up and the shoulder on the other side is probably a little lower. So if I was going to draw that other side, I would probably draw it a little bit lower, like drawing an x-ray through here so that I can get that kind of straight leg on this foot, on this hoof. I'm used to teaching drawing classes with humans, so <laughs> hooves and feet, kind of confusing. Oh, yeah. So now I'm going to get the neck muscles in, and basically what I'm doing is I'm following the forms of these muscles that come in like so. I'm basically going to get them in. I'm not going to bother going super detailed with them. But I want to make sure that they're that I at least acknowledge that they're there, that there's this massive form here. And that massive form 
of this sternocleido muscle brings you to the ear here. And then the other ear we're going to put there so we have a nice little <clears throat> replication on both sides. And so I'm going to start doing it and I'm going to start erasing some of these extra sketchy lines so that I can see more of my drawing through the sketches. And what I normally do with a drawing when I'm doing it, like say for a comic book, I'll do this as the underpinning of the drawing and then uh, underdrawing, and then I'll go with a light box and I'll redraw it. But in this case, I'm going to try and do it all in one piece because, you know, why not? So the head, what we're going to deal with on the head is right here, we've got the brow of the horse right there. And then we're going to come in. It's going to go over, hit the brow, come in, and then go over the nostril down here. And the nostrils on a running horse flare out quite a bit. So we're going to allow that to flare. And we're going to draw the nostril hole there. Yes, flare. Flare like the wind. And we're going to put, well, he has to breathe hard. So his nostrils are going to be wide open. And get the mouth in here. Think of it like these, the horses and greyhounds are kind of similar in the uh, leg shape. Well, their right. basic structure is, yeah, for, is yeah. a mammal structure, right? And then they share a lot of... We have a greyhound, that's why she's asking. They share a lot of similarities I'm in the not, leg design. I'm not asking. I'm you're saying. stating. You're saying. You're right, you are saying. <laughs> so up here, there's... One of the ways I like to think about this is that there's kind of like a cone that comes down from the ears that forms the flat... So the... The horse's skull kind of does this. Around the eyes. And the ears are up here. So if you imagine, this is kind of a bulby area here. Bulby. Obtrusive. It, uh, what is, what, I can't think of the word. Uh, it bulges here. Bulge. So if there's a bulge here, and then it flattens out over the cranium. So we go here and we can draw the eye in that bulge. So the eye would fit in here. And then you have the cheekbone of the horse right like that. And so we're going to go here. And now I'm just going to refine stuff that I did in the drawing here. I'm going to get some of the details in. I'm going to start shading stuff in a little bit. And one of the rules that I have about shading is that in line drawing is if I can avoid doing rendering, I will. If I can do it with a line or a mark. Here's a file. I have a few things for you. Yeah, what's up? Oh, I don't need those, but thank you. But you might if I might. you decide you. to ink. I'm probably not going to because I probably don't have the time to ink, but we'll see. You but so... <clears throat> in, the, in the video, and you're that far. So the eye, I know, the eye is going to fit in here, in the socket, and we're going to draw under what would be the voice box around that muscle. Steve Higgins. Jim Higgins? Jim Higgins. Dang it. Anyways, uh, that Jim Higgins said that straight on view was very helpful. Oh, good. Glad that helped. Yeah, I like to think in things and think of things in three dimensions. So if I'm drawing something from the side, I have to know what it's doing from the front. Um, otherwise, it's it's kind of like you can get lost really easily. The mouth should be a little lower. The weird thing about horses is, unlike people, they don't have facial expressions in the same way. So like, you always want to draw like, oh, I'm, draw I'm running, so I want to be really excited. But the horses just kind of run. It's kind of weird. It's like my dog. They don't have facial expressions. I'm used to drawing facial expressions so much that... The, 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 the eyes have expressions? It, it yeah, the eyes do. Because they're so big. Yep, they, they do, but 
Anyway, they, yeah, but they're they're not as sorry. I shouldn't move on. Anyway, so I'm going to move on to some other forms here. So remembering that we had this shoulder form here, right here you've got the horse's scapula under the skin, and then you've got his shoulder, and then you've got his elbow down here, and the, the skin kind of folds over like so. So when you're drawing that, and you've got, let's see, this would be like the equivalent to, I don't know the names of horse muscles, to be honest with you, but I know they're equivalents in humans. So this is the essentially the deltoid area up here, and then you've got your tricep and what would be a bicep there, and then this is their forearm. So you can draw, I like to draw everything in, in essentially in beams or bubbles. So I try to keep track of all these beans and bubbles, keep track of where they are, how they fit, and then I'm going to, and that's why I was doing these orbs before, because it keeps me honest with where the knee is going to be. And where the ankle's going to go. So what's weird is that this is actually, so like this is the horse's elbow, that's his wrist, and these are his knuckles. If you think about you human question? anatomy. Yep. Uh, from Michael. Morant. Uh, uh, he's asked, are you using reference? Oh, I am using a photo. <laughs> um, because, yes, I, I, I was going to mention that at the beginning. Yeah, I'm using a photo because I want to be, here, I'll show you the reference that I'm using so you don't think I'm just like a super genius, but I'm looking at this photo, but I'm modifying it from there. Uh, you got to bring it down. Oh, sorry. Ooh, like that? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I am using reference. That's how I'm getting the details. Um, sorry, I, I hope that you don't consider that cheating, but I did the kids one and I did it from my head. And this one I'm doing, anytime I was trying to, anytime I try and do something for, our, for a professional piece, I always use some form of reference. So while I like that horse that I was that I was taking that I had the photo of from that book, I want this to be a kind of a thinner and more lithe horse. So I'm going for something that's a little bit more uh, extended and long. So now I'm going to bring under here. But there are, I mean, there are some things that I know from having drawn a lot that I kind of just pull in naturally. So if I know that I have a light source coming down like this, which is the sun, everything that's 90 degrees to that is going to be in shadow. So when you see, even if I'm not looking at the reference, I'll know that the light is coming down like this. So this area here is casting a shadow in here. And that's just like essentially math. So if I go again, I come down here, this is going to be in shadow. This is going to be in shadow underneath the chin. And I can just kind of bring it through. So if I, if I want, what I can do is I can say this part right here is what's known as the terminal line. It's the edge between the light and the shadow. And I'm going to separate those out and say basically everything on this side of this line is going to be in the shadow. So I can now go Like so. Michael uh, said, uh, not cheating, thought you were, and it was relevant. Oh, yeah, no, that's good, good, relevant. Good, good point. I just forgot. Uh, no, I, yeah, you yeah. have to use, you have, you have to use photo reference to, to do anything that's going to have any, mo any amount of real, realism to it. And then he also did another comment, uh, saying, also, there are differences in the horse's muscular. Musculature? Yeah. But only artists like George Stubbs would know them. Oh, between human and, 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 and horse? Oh, yeah, there are. But <clears throat> from an external view, what I, know, what I learned many, many years ago is, is to look at the surface and try to understand what's going on under the surface. And the basics, when I look at this, I can see the basic, uh, same, similar understanding that we have to humans. And so, like, I can see how 
there are these separate muscle groups, there are these areas on the body that, that correspond. And so for my purposes, just being able to say, hey, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a wrist and that's an elbow, it's a good way of kind of giving myself a, uh, a, an easy, um, then, what do you call it, analog. We also have another comment okay. from Alfred Jones. Okay. Uh, references are definitely not cheating. I'm two years into drawing and I use references often. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I was just saying that because like I, I didn't want you to think that I was like pulling this out of thin air. Um, Dad. Yeah. Jim Higgins said, Jim Higgins said, "Am I missing something, or is the back right leg not there?" This stuff hasn't been resolved yet. If that's what you're wondering, I'm still working up here, in the front. So I'm gonna get to this area as I go. But yeah, the back right leg, the far leg, right now is kind of ghosting this leg. So oh, yeah. we see the little you can kind of see there. it sticking out here. See the eyes on the if you want, I'll, you know, I'll switch right over to that. So we go back here to what's essentially the 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 kind of reverse knee. <laughs> And you know, okay. treat that like an orb as well. And then Jim Higgins said, uh, okay. And then right here, we're going to have that ankle again. And then the foot or the hoof yeah. comes out like so. So the, what we'll notice about horses is that on one side of their body, their hooves are in the air. And on the other side of the body, the hooves are touching. That was one of the things that Edward Moybridge figured out is that Horses run kind of like people. They used to think that horses jumped with their front legs and then brought back their, their, their back legs. But in reality, they walk just like we do. So, uh, or they walk side to side as opposed to front back. Um, which is weird because my dog, as far as I can tell watching her, and I could be wrong, she's a greyhound. And it looks like when she's really cooking, she's running... Uh, front to back like she's leaping uh from her front from her back she's pushing off with her back paws together uh and and leaping with her front paws so back here that back leg jim we're gonna go we're gonna create our again the ankle and the hoof so this hoof here has to do the these two hooves here in the back have to do the weight or do the job of keeping the horse on the ground while it's jumping. So we've caught this horse in kind of mid motion. So now let's get back to, here's our rib cage on the horse. And if you ever see a, a horse that's skinny, you'll see ribs kind of come through like this, but this is not a skinny horse, so we'll not do that. But you'll see the analog of what we have on our body there. And then we can separate that out and then I'm gonna do the same. Here we have our, what would be the horse's gluteus maximus area up here. You, say you know it what that is, is, don't you, Luna? Yeah. So we're gonna get the gluteus maximus back here. Um, and I gotta measure stuff out because I may have gone a little long with this. It's always something that I need to do whenever I'm drawing is I always check my measurements. And sometimes when I'm doing demos, I find like teaching at Syracuse, like sometimes I end up going wacky because I don't look at my drawing um, because I'm talking the whole time. So sometimes I gotta check myself and make sure I don't go off. But essentially, we're gonna see something like this. In fact, I don't like that back leg there. But you can see how building these, these essential sections give us the different forms for the leg. So now, again, if we start treating it from that light source above, this being a three-dimensional object and not just a two-dimensional object, it's going to have shading on it. So I'm going to treat it like I'm going to create a shadow here for the gluteus muscle, and I'll create a shadow here. And then essentially, I can create a terminal line, the terminal line being that separation between light the light side of things and the dark side of things. So I'll create that terminal line here. Questions. Yeah, more questions? No. Oh, okay. Just say, please ask questions. 
And then I've got the underside of the belly here, so I'll put a terminal line there. And then you can pick up the paper clips. Do you have a magnet? You can play with magnets and paper clips. They're really fun. Um, so then no, I don't know. we can get you one. So one of the things I like to do is uh, once I've gotten my looser drawing done, I start to shore up my drawings, my details, and I'll start tightening these lines up. And I erase them. Just try and remember where I put the other line so I didn't forget. And then I can clean up that line and get kind of a sharper, more exacting version of the line. So I'm going to do that throughout here. And I'm going to get this ear here. Yesterday I did a dragon and I didn't have any reference mic, so, you know, that's why. <laughs> I had to go with my gut. Uh, Michael it's hard to find Brack, photos of, of dragons. Uh, what? That Michael Brack said, no need to read this to your dad, but he might have to want to explain to the viewers that erasing is totally okay. And that all oh, erasing is awesome. Yes, erasing is actually part of the, part of the, uh, part of everything you do. Like, if you don't erase, like, I, I used to have teachers in high school who told me, never erase, never erase. And I, I don't really understand why they told me that. Because I erase all the time. And as a professional artist who's been doing this for 30 years, if I didn't have an eraser, I'd be in trouble. Um, <laughs> yes. but, but I can understand one level is, to some degree, what I think erasers do do is they make people change everything really quickly. Uh, before they have had a chance to see how everything works together in their drawing. So the reason why I did that really loose drawing at first, and I kept all those lines in there, was really so that I could figure out where everything was and figure out all my relationships. And then, once I've got those relationships figured out, I can erase the lines I don't want. But I think part of the problem is that people erase too early and they get rid of the important stuff, the important lines that, um, that like the extra, you know, sometimes, you know, it's not the first line, it's like the 12th line that is the right line. And as you can see, I'm going over things and kind of reassessing as I draw each mark is kind of a re rethinking of the last mark. Michael. Yeah. Rack said, uh, "Ha! I've seen so many dragon pictures." <laughs> You've seen so many dragon pictures? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I did that the first day because that was the the request of my of someone. I forget, but I'm preferring for this for this up like later class to do stuff that's a little bit more realistic. Earlier, I did or more natural at least. Earlier I did uh, I did a unicorn, and we could still make this a unicorn if we want. Right. But well, so anyway, with this, I wanted to make sure that you guys know, like, what I'm thinking about through this is is that light source from the pub is going to make me choose to draw all of these. And I remember I had a teacher, Jerome Whitkin, who pointed out, and I thought this was really funny, was that uh, that Michelangelo drew all of his muscles as eggs. And I remember laughing about it then, and then looking at his drawings and going, holy cow, he's right. So what he, did, what he did was, there were all these shapes that were kind of squished up against each other in the muscles. And he kind of paid attention. If you pay attention to where those muscles are on the surface, you have these muscles. And then if you treat them, A, you treat them two different ways. You treat them that they all are connected, so they're all one group. So they have a highlight here, and they all have a shadow that they share. And then you treat them separately so that each one has its own terminal line as well. So you get this kind of an effect here. Uh, I have to go see if the dog is Okay, barking. go ahead. So that's how, that's, I mean, this is a very crude version of what Michelangelo would do, but that's what my teacher Jerome used to show us, was that it was essentially like you're creating these kind of blobs that rest on top of each other. There's a guy, Glenn Vilpu, who's a really excellent drawing teacher who talks about uh, basing your drawing on blobs. Blossom. You don't have to bring the dog in, do you? She came in. Hello, dog. She came in. She came in. She, she, she acted like she was I know. Invited. Here she is. Hi, dog. How you doing? I wonder if they can see her in the camera. <laughs> like, yeah, well, maybe she is. So, essentially, I'm going to bring... <laughs> Living at home with 
working at home with your kids. I have to keep, I have to keep the dog from... <laughs> so we want to make sure that these muscles are all coming around in, and then I'm going to erase the upper part and just keep myself honest with the shadows of those muscles. No, 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 just let her stay out there. Well, she wants to stay inside. Yeah, I know. She wants a lot of things. Possums, get over here. All right, just, just leave her alone, please. Okay. This is getting distracting. Okay. So, um, so that's a basic horse running. And then if we want to really make it feel like it's moving, we get the hair in here. I'm going to try and keep the hair loose. And yet shadowed. So I'm bringing the lights. I mean, I'm bringing the shadow from the bottom of its neck. Uh, from sorry, from the top of its neck out. Imagining that again, the light source is coming from above. And so, because the light source is coming from above, we're getting a shadow under the hair. So it's important to treat the hair like it's a three-dimensional object, as opposed to treating it like like it's uh, what do you call it? Um, Frizzy. People tend to like to draw students that always want to draw every single strand of hair. And uh, I think the best way to treat it is treat it as giant shapes. So if you draw, draw these shapes and then you bring shadows underneath them, treat them almost like you're drawing waves or, or cloth. Um, and you can keep the edges a little ragged, but really you're dealing with hair that's going to come, basically hair, there's enough grease in our hair, there's enough grease in horses' hair, that hair tends to clump together. It doesn't come out in strands. So if we're going to have, if you're going to have a sense of that movement, you want to have a sense of, you want to bring these lines across and down. I'm going to do the same here. So I'm going to go down, again, think of that light source up there in the top. And I'm going to shade this area here. I can just let this go to black. And then if you can hear in the background, there is a discussion between my daughter and my son about what to do with the dog. So if you're wondering. <laughs> As you can tell, this is a high tech operation here, folks. So, I'm sorry. That's okay. We had technical difficulties. We had technical dog difficulties. <laughs> that was a bad joke, but I'm a dad. I'm allowed. So what I'm doing now is I'm going dog. through and finding areas where objects move away from the light source. So anytime an object moves away from the light source, like say the light source is here, Oops. you're gonna get a shadow, right? You get a shadow and you're going to get a terminal line. The terminal line is where is the separation between the light side and the dark side. So if you keep that in mind, it's another name for it is the core shadow. If you keep that in mind, right, every time we're shifting direction on the horse, we're going to get a shadow. Now, if this is a hard object, horses aren't made of blocks, right? So on a rounded object, if the light's coming across the object, it's going to hit, and eventually there's going to be a point, maybe here, where the light can no longer hit. And that is, again, the terminal line. So if you have this rounded object, everything on this side is going to be in the dark side. And you need to have your terminal line. It's going to be the darkest area on the surface of the object. Okay. And then you have, in here, you have your reflected light. So you have your main light source hitting here, and right here, and you'd have like the highlight. And then you have the main color of the object. And then you have your terminal line, and you have your reflected light. And there's more stuff you could think about. There's other names for different things, but that's essentially what we're talking about. So we've got, if you have a highlight on an object, which you always do, 
you're going to have the local color, which is what the object looks like in regular daylight. Then you're going to have the terminal line, when the daylight stops being able to touch it. And then you have the reflected light, when the daylight passes beyond it and bounces back in. So when I'm drawing the top of this horse's head here, I'm thinking this flat area, like this, is catching this light. And then we have this ridge where the skull changes direction. It goes from here to there. And there's a change of direction right along that line. So if that's our change of direction line there, that's where my terminal line is going to go. And so there are big terminal lines and there are little terminal lines. And what I mean by that is that there are terminal lines for entire masses of the body, like this, and then there are terminal lines for each individual muscle. So when you're doing this kind of a drawing, you want to imagine that if this, this is the light side here, right? Oh, what is going on with the dog, honey? Can you please get her out of here? You're going to, or take her out, outside. You're going to imagine that the bone structure here is right here. And you can follow that down. So it's a plane down to its nose, which is essentially like that. And so that comes here. So we have this plane here. And we have the side planes here. And so we can just kind of shade this away from that main light source and then keep going with that. So if the head is in shadow at this point, the whole neck is probably going to be catching shadow from the head. So you're going to cast shadow from the head when an object is blocking something else from the light, you're going to get a cast shadow from the head. And then since we know the shoulder bulges out from the side of the neck, we're, these are going to catch light again. So you're going to have these in light. And you're going to get this kind of effect. Everything on this side here is going to be in light. And everything on this side of that terminal line is going to be in shadow. So I'm going to run across it with a kind of a loose line like this and then give it more refinement as I go. And what I like to do is like to, as a rule, but not necessarily follow it all the time, is render toward the light source. So in a way, I keep in mind that all of my marks are kind of pointing at my light source. So if my light's up here, I can create this illusion of depth. So they're and, and they're moving towards the light source and they're moving around the form. So if you want to do crosshatch, you can bring it across and around and then eventually point towards the form. So you can go like like that. And that creates the sense of moving across and around the object. So I'm still building these terminal lines here, finding the edge between light and dark. And I can do the same over here. And this I'm making up because I'm just going to go with the how the anatomy of the horse works. So I know that there's this ankle object here. On the photo I have, it's all blurry. But I know enough from this leg and how this leg works that I should be able to guess within the realm of accuracy how this looks here. So now same thing I'm going to do here. This area of the belly is probably going to catch a little bit, I mean not the belly, the rib cage is going to catch a little bit of light right in the middle here. So we're going to move across. I'm going to find my terminal line. 
in there. I want to remember that this is casting a shadow on here, so that can get really nice and dark. This arm, the upper front leg, I mean, is casting a shadow. Um, this back leg is going to have some serious shadow from the upper body there. The rib cage casts a shadow in two places here, and then there's this tendons that connect between here and under its leg. And they go down like this, and so I'm going to treat that like so. And then I'm going to go back to looking at the light on this. So if my light source is coming from this direction. The other fun thing, or nice thing about using the light source as the direction lines in a drawing like this is it keeps the movement of the drawing going. So if I'm going across the object in this direction, it gives the sense of movement to the whole drawing. So as I go, I end up with this very intense kind of flow, hopefully, through the whole piece. Is anyone asking any questions? Nope. Okay. Or comments. No comments, just quietness, okay. Yeah. All quiet on the Western Front. So now if I want to make it really feel like it's moving, i got to have some ground in there. What time are we at, actually? Uh, we are at 3.46. Oh, okay, so we're a little bit past time. So let's see, can we see the whole drawing there? So this is the, the finished drawing. Yeah. And we did... And this part here, I would probably go in with a little bit more shading in this direction, just to give it a little bit more depth. But. And but I think essentially, essentially, we're done. All right. I hope everyone had a great time. I hope you got to draw a little bit, maybe. And uh, I will see you here tomorrow. Oh, Michael, before, before we go, yeah? uh, Michael said we are watching the awesomeness. <laughs> well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it.